Hello and welcome to Let's H. I'm Hush Cho and today we have a surprising review. But first I'd like to point you to the blurb. Check out the little read more and all the links underneath. There's a lot of great stuff there. Take a look, subscribe to my channel and follow me on social media if you like what I do. Become a patron on Patreon for more bonuses. Thanks. So today I've been tempted at least a little bit down the rabbit hole. You may remember that for a while I was doing reviews on... American Horror Story Hotel. And you may remember how much I hated American Horror Story Hotel. But although I've seen all of the seasons except for one up to then, I never did watch through Freak Show. Freak Show happened just after I had watched Coven. And so I really wasn't feeling the American Horror Story vibe. It was unfortunate because I was genuinely curious about Freak Show, but the combination of musical theater plus creators of Glee, along with the crappiness of how Coven ended, didn't exactly inspire a lot of confidence in me. I heard things from friends, most especially one friend that's watched just about all of the series, and I remember thinking that it did sound pretty interesting. So I finally got around to watching this. I decided to watch episode one. This is going to be a series of my thoughts on the episodes, and just like Hotel... If I start to get turned off the series, I may stop. But until then, you've got my thoughts on all the episodes. While this review deals with just the first episode, other reviews may combine episodes in them. I just wanted to take this first episode because after I got done with it, I was actually so moved by the fact that it was so much better than anything in Hotel. But if you compare the first episodes of Hotel and Freak Show which may actually have helped me, like it may actually have helped me to watch Hotel to have something to compare this to. But if you compare the first episodes of both of those series, it's like night and day. The first episode of American Horror Story Freak Show could stand on its own as a satisfying film. It's a fascinating examination of very interesting characters. There are a few parts that don't quite hit the way that I think they were intending, but overall it's very good. Of course, Jessica Lange as Elsa Marr steals the show. And this is one thing that the series kind of drives home. When you watch Hotel, it doesn't have Jessica Lange in it. But when you watch Freak Show, of course, it has Jessica Lange in it. And even though it's an ensemble cast and you have a lot of great performances, Evan Peters is super sexy as Jimmy Darling, for example. Elsa Mars takes the spotlight and pretty much steals every scene she's in. It's not a bad thing. It's a really good thing. Because, to contrast that, What's-Her-Face from Hotel sleepwalks through every scene she's in. Every time you see her coming on the screen, you know it's going to be a snoozer. It goes for the other actors, too. When Jessica Lang is interacting with people, it makes their performances better because she gives them something to interact with. She gives them something to react to. She has a lot of passion for the material, even when it's not particularly good, as we've seen in previous seasons. She can make something seem compelling and emotional that some other actor, a lesser actor, wouldn't be able to do. The cast flailing ineffectually in Hotel is contrasted by them actually coming together with someone to bring them together in Freak Show, and that's what Jessica Lange does best. She's an excellent actress, but she's also the glue that holds the ensemble cast together. Without her, they don't really work very well. The story is one that's handled with, in part at least, a little more subtlety and finesse than typical for American Horror Story. There's some sensationalism, some exploitation, but that much is kind of standard and to be expected for the series and the writer's general approach to it. The acting across the board is of pretty good quality. I can say that it's a lot better than some of the acting that we got in Coven so far, and the writing overall comes together very well, at least for the first episode, in terms of the setting and setting up all the pieces, but as I said, it could stand very well on its own, as like a short film or something like that. The interactions between characters is also very natural, like between Elsa and the twins. Sarah Paulson shows that she has surprisingly good acting skills, very solid performance as the conjoined twins. As you may remember from my hotel reviews, I was actually kind of impressed by her performance in Hotel as Hypodermic Sally. I was not impressed 
by her performances Cordelia and Coven, but the psychic she played in Murder House was fine, and she had moments where she was very good and moments where she wasn't quite so convincing in Asylum, but I didn't really like Asylum, so I'm kind of biased against that one. My friend that watched all the other series, though, really likes Asylum, so your mileage may vary. But I was impressed with her here as the twins, because that's really a role that a lot of people don't get a chance to play, and I can only imagine it's a very difficult role. Like, this isn't the kind of role they really prepare you for in any kind of acting school or training, I'd imagine. As I said before, Evan Peters' as Jimmy Darling is truly compelling and very appealing. What I like the most about him is that he's very charming, and he comes across as highly charismatic. And I know the actor is very charismatic. He's a very talented actor and very able to do, even with material that may be difficult for other people. I wasn't too impressed with his Frankenbro in Coven, but that was because he didn't have a lot of material to work with. In fact, maybe the most compelling thing he did in that was literally to show his ass. There's a helpless shrug kind of going over me here right now. <laughs> but after I saw Murder House, I thought he made an excellent Tate Langdon, because he should be very attractive, and you don't know if he's really that evil or not. Like, you just don't know. I know that that some people have said one way, some people have said another way, but the fact of the matter is, someone like Tate should make you wonder if you could just take him at his word, and you could just love him, or let him love you. But you just don't know, and he's got issues, he's got damage, because he's a ghost, and even when he was alive, he had a lot of damage. The afterlife, as a ghost, has not done a huge amount to help Tate deal with what he needs to deal with. I don't think he's irredeemable, but I think that in the course of Murder House's story, it didn't do enough to address what Tate needed. So, whatever happened, it probably wouldn't have been enough anyway. It's still a story that I think is better told than most of the other seasons, but in large part that's because of the excellence of the casting. Here in Freak Show 2, he gets to play a character that is similarly complicated. Jimmy has aspirations of equality, which is a good thing. Initially, he has very strong feelings about why this is not the way they should have to live, just because they're slightly different than other people. His mother Ethel, the bearded lady, played by Kathy Bates, is fiercely loyal to Elsa, and she seems to accept that this is their lot in life. As Elsa has pointed out earlier, a lot of the time, the quote-unquote freaks were treated very poorly by society, often shut in horrible mental institutions, treated as de facto scapegoats for crimes they didn't commit, and in general driven to the fringe of society. We feel Jimmy is right, but we also feel that his mother has a point. However, events during the episode caused Jimmy's loyalties and thoughts to shift sharply. But understandably, the viewer gets a kind of heady excitement at joining this strange and beautiful world that most people never even get a peek into. But it also turns a little bit ugly with the sour of the experience, most notably in the fact that the police are intending to use some of them as fall guys for crimes which they may or may not have committed. Add to that a homicidal clown wandering around the countryside, and you have a recipe for terrifying, terrifying stuff. Does it succeed? Well, mostly. Even Twisty the Clown, as overdone as crazy clown killers are, kinda works. The actor playing Twisty the Clown is very, very good, and extremely compelling with the character. It's a character that could very easily become silly or become too dependent on his grotesque appearance. What happens with the depiction, however, is that he feels like he actually has more depth. He's not just some masked killer, he has a reason for doing what he's doing. It could very easily become pastiche or ludicrous instead of being dramatic, but at no point during the first episode does it ever become silly. I'm sure that the design of a homicidal clown was to prey upon people that have a fear of clowns, which is actually fairly common. I don't have that fear, but Twisty's design makes you uncomfortable to look at. It's extremely unsettling. I kind of joke to myself that Twisty's performance lacked a certain something, but that's just kind of my own joke about it, since, as you will see, 
he doesn't stick to too great a consistency in hilarious performances and wondrous things. He does a few tricks, and then when the audience is predictably less than enthused, goes completely haywire. The setting of Jupiter, Florida in the 50s is a particularly evocative one. The 50s were not a pleasant time. Well, there are these wonderful colors and fashions and styles and these delightful pieces of art and design from the time, the 50s were a pretty miserable decade, so it's always ripe to use this time as a setting in horror or in dystopian stuff. I especially like setting it in Florida because most of the cinematography gives that kind of claustrophobic, suffocating, tropical environment. As a person who really hates the heat, and much prefers the cool, it serves to make me more uncomfortable, which is something that horror should do. Of course, it's marvellous to see all these cast members that we didn't see in Hotel, like Francis Conroy playing a delightfully bitchy, horrible character. It's always fantastic to see her trade barbs with Jessica Lange. I love that. I absolutely love that. And on that note, Elsa's performance of Life on Mars was nothing short of breathtaking. It drew you in, it was just so beautiful, and I think part of what lends it poignance, and most especial poignance, is what has happened between when it aired and now. It moved me even more to see that performance now than it probably would have then, so it's actually kind of good that I waited until now. It also made her sense of loss and disappointment more palpable, more affecting. Dandy and his mother are horrible people. And Elsa's performance was masterful. There's no reason why she should have to play to a barely populated tent. One really does believe that she is a star, and that she just got unfairly treated. I don't know the circumstances of it, but I feel for Elsa because she backs it up with her ability. And she seems to truly believe that this is something better, more honorable. She's showed it many times in public, and she does everything she can for her chosen family. I have no delusions, though. I'm almost entirely sure that things will change so drastically in the next 11 episodes, or maybe 12, I forget, that it might not even be recognizable once I get to the end. Fair enough. That's what American Horror Story does best. What do I see is happening? Well, for one, I'm going to just call it here. I'm going to say that the bearded lady starts to get ideas. The reason why this doesn't really work for me, though, is that Elsa confesses to her that she brought in the twins more for herself than for everybody else. She's also high on what I can assume is maybe opium? I don't know. It's something that has been established to actually affect the psyche and make people's personalities change a bit. So if she is intoxicated, she's obviously not herself, and this is probably something that Ethel has experienced before. Ethel reacts to us as the audience, but unseen by Elsa, and I have this feeling like it's supposed to be something that changes her opinion, but if she's been with Elsa this long, she probably knows a lot of things that other people don't. If she's as close as the story is building her up as being, one event, one thing is not something that can actually change a person's opinion about someone, especially if they've latched onto that person and put them on a pedestal, as Elsa has been put. Kathy Bates is a good actress, but I maintain that she needs something to react to and react with. She needs material, and she needs a good actor to complement or contrast. Fortunately, Jessica Lange does a great job at this, but if previous series are any indication, there will be less and less of that interaction, and she'll be off on her own, which is not an ideal circumstance for her. I fully expect the whole freak unity thing to be undermined in future episodes, and that's a shame. I also expect it not to be handled with nearly enough finesse or sensitivity to the topic, because, let's be honest, American Horror Show is not the most sensitive of shows. Sequences in Coven marked some of the tackiest crap that I'd ever seen until I saw Hotel, which was, overall, the tackiest crap I had ever seen. So I'm not going to hold my breath that Freak Show will be much different. I also don't expect particularly any characters to remain consistent from the first episode to the last. That simply doesn't happen in American Horror Story. Oftentimes characters will change between episodes or even in the same episode to a completely different character. 
So I'm not going to wait for something that I don't think is going to happen, which would be consistency within the same character paradigm. I'm also not particularly going to wait for a fulfilling ending. I don't anticipate it's going to happen. The only time that ever happened in my memory was in the first season, Murder House. It was a macabre happy ending, but it was a happy ending for some of the characters. It wasn't perfectly fulfilling, but most of the characters ended up getting what they wanted, even though it wasn't necessarily in the form that they wanted. However, overall I have to say that compared to Hotel, Freak Show is a refreshing breath of air. Whereas Hotel was everything tawdry, poorly written, poorly acted, and desperate flailing of an ensemble cast that could never come together, as well as completely underused members of said cast that might have actually brought it out of the gutter, Freak Show comes together very well in the first episode and gives a promise of better things to come. Whether or not that will be born through, I don't know. I can't say. But as for the first episode, it really is a masterpiece of television in its own way. If the series had begun and ended with this single episode, it would have been perfect as it is. So I'll be continuing on to the second episode and seeing whether or not it can hold my attention for another one. So what did you think? Please feel free to comment below. And as I said before, try and check out my links in the blurb. Become a patron on Patreon if you like what I do. Follow on social media, subscribe to my channels. I'd love to have you around. Thanks very much for listening with me. I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.